So this morning, the question that we all want to um, ask and, and ponder as a group is um, how can AI and machine learning contribute to the creative industries? Um, I want to start out with um, introducing our panel. I'm going to start at the, at the end at, at Chance. Everyone's going to give you a couple of minutes on who they are, and then Josie Rourke is going to then bring us into a creative moment, which she will tell you after we start. So Chance, please tell everybody about yourself. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chance Kokenauer. I'm a program manager for Google Arts and Culture. Um, I'm also an archaeologist, so I'm here today speaking from both of those perspectives. So my background is I'm an archaeologist in, uh, focused on the uh, pre-Columbian societies of Central America. I am focused in uh, creating three-dimensional models and preserving cultural heritage and communicating that uh, to the world in multiple languages and multiple visual ways, including 3D and VR. Uh, from archaeology, I moved to um, creating a crowdsourcing platform to reconstruct and recreate and preserve the memory of lost heritage. Some of you may have heard it uh, before. It was called Project Mosul, and it was focused on the objects that were destroyed in the Mosul Museum by the self-proclaimed Islamic State. And we used crowdsourcing photographs that volunteers, that tourists provided to our uh, crowdsourcing platform and use them to create photogrammetric, uh, realistic 3D models to preserve the memory of lost objects. And since I've joined Google Arts and Culture, I'm working on projects that span from ancient history to the present day. And some of the present day, uh, one present day example I'll give you is uh, finding a way to preserve art that has been created in the last three decades, uh, trying to avoid digital obsolescence for artworks that have been created in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s when software and hardware uh, makes it difficult for artist works to be accessible. Great, I'm gonna move over to Thomas and then Josie will introduce the project. Thomas Hogue. Thank you, Susan. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, here because I sort of cross different fields. I'm an artist on one hand and um, an investor and a company builder on another. Um, and I've always been interested in the interplay between the human and the machines uh, and, and how we can how we can use machines in, in interesting artistic ways. Now we have, you know, we've seen lots of examples of ways we can, we can uh, enhance works and we can uh, manipulate and we can transform and so on. Um, but where it tips over into actual artistic uh, endeavors um, is sort of the, the boundary that we haven't quite navigated yet. So I'm very interested in, in also uh, seeing a little bit of that uh, in, uh, in uh, the performance this morning. And I'm particularly interested at the moment looking at how, um, how text-based work uh, is starting to, to hit some interesting boundaries where, uh, where the, the use of technology is starting to spit back works that starts to become humanly, uh, human in, in the form of, of affection, of, of empathy, and the kind of things that we think about when we think about art. So uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. And 20 years ago, I came over here to work as chief marketing officer of News International's new digital division at the time. And I find myself here now, after years of Foster Group, putting partnerships together between corporations and arts institutions, finding it all pretty full circle back here in Wapping. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Josie Rourke, Sarah, and Nicholas. And go ahead, Josie. Hello, hi, morning everybody. Um, so I am the artistic director of the Donma Warehouse, which is my job, but my trade is as a director, mainly a theatre director. And I think one of the reasons I've been asked along today is because some of the work that I've done, specifically a handful of plays, has looked at technology, also AI, and how it affects us as human beings. So that work has included, the first play I did was a, a really great play by a writer called Matt Sharman. He's also a screenwriter. Um, he actually wrote Bridge of Spies, if anyone's seen that Spielberg movie. And he wrote a great play called The Machine, which was about Kasparov losing to Deep Blue. So that was my first proper encounter uh, with AI and starting to think about that world. I then, at the same time as uh, working on that play as a director, was co-creating a play with a writer called James Graham. 
who is better known probably as a sort of political playwright who wrote a play called This House and is just doing a big Brexit drama for Channel 4. So he writes a lot about politics, but we worked on a show called Privacy, which in its last incarnation we did with Daniel Radcliffe at the Public Theatre in New York. And that play was a kind of amazing experiment to see what would happen. And I can slightly see it happening now, actually, if you allowed an audience to have their mobile phones on during a performance. <laughs> so the idea about that was to look at the way in which this thing that we normally have in our hands all the time interacts with our lives and what would occur if it was on during the show. And we had some fun because the Snowden revelations had just occurred. And so we interviewed a lot of the journalists involved and worked a lot of that in documentary style into the play and gently over the course of the play it was actually much easier to do this in america legally than it was in the uk although that will change post brexit we basically gently hacked the audience's phones during the show by having them sign on to a free wi-fi network don't know if anyone signed on to the insecure wi-fi here this morning just something maybe to think about there um, and and uh, more recently i directed a beautiful play by a writer called nick payne called elegy um, that gave us the opportunity to talk to some neuroscientists specifically about AI and that was a place set in the near future that imagined what would happen if you could cure dementia by a series of interventions into the brain that's based on what a lot of their sort of research into AI is doing right now. So that's kind of why it's interacted with my work directly and narratively. As a theatre director, it's also just something I'm really interested in in my practice as an artist. So Susan, very kindly invited me to see if I could start with a little artistic moment um, uh, with this session. So I last week spent about 45 minutes talking to a chatbot, although when you ask her if she's a chatbot, she denies it. But um, <laughs> I basically typed into Google award-winning chatbot uh, and found a chatbot that had won more, and more, more awards than I had, so that seemed good. And I tried to have a conversation with this chatbot about a number of Shakespeare plays and after trying Romeo and Juliet and messing around in Macbeth I kind of settled on Hamlet so what you'll hear is an edited version of that conversation uh, where Nick in a controversial piece of casting will read me uh, and Sarah will read the chatbot um, just a few things to bear in mind before these guys start so the first thing is um, I start off trying to be Hamlet realize that doesn't work and then change tack and try to tell the chatbot the story of Hamlet um, and that seemed to sort of uh, uh, work a bit better and we might have some questions about it later. The other thing to say is I am completely fascinated. I have never used these things except at a music festival actually in silent disco. This seems to me a slight abuse of the technology. Um, but what's interesting about it, and this is interesting from a theatre point of view and a, a cool way to think about technology, is that, I, I mean, I talk with my hands a lot anyway, right? But in theatre, we talk a lot about non-verbal signifiers. So what you can't do completely is understand someone's meaning if you can't see their body. And often when actors turn to face up stage, away from the audience in a performance, they actually have to go louder because being able to see their mouths, provided if you're sighted, is part of what has you understand what they're saying. Like it just affects it, you have to go louder if you turn away. That's not just about volume, that's about being able to see what their lips are doing and understanding what that is. So what was really interesting and I observed as I was just watching you all as Susan was doing her introductions, obviously like some people are on their phones and that's completely fine because welcome to the real world. But what a lot of you were doing was in what I would call your kind of podcast space. So there's an amazing disconnection already with what's going on here between you being able to go, there's a voice in my head that feels a bit disconnected from this body here because it's being compressed, retooled, amplified and put into your head in a different way. And I have no idea, having heard these two actors act out this play just like over a coffee table this morning with me, how quite it's going to work when there's that disconnection between their bodies and their voices in your head. So that's going to be a little bit of an experiment for me as well. Okay, I'm going to ask these guys to stand up just because the sight lines at the back are pretty terrible. And this is probably going to be about five minutes of your lives. I think it's always good to say that. <laughs> okay, thanks. I am Mitsuku. I want to be your friend. That's good. I need a friend I can trust. Oh. You are a poet. I'm actually studying philosophy. Is philosophy a difficult subject to learn? Yes. And? My dad has died. I am sorry to hear of your loss. Were you close to your dad? It's complicated. Do you want to see a magic trick? Is it the ghost of my dad? Match limit exceeded. What is the trick? A cunning or deceitful action. 
There's a lot of deceit in my home. There sure is. I think that my uncle killed my dad. Is that your mother or father's brother? My father's brother. Is this something that all humans have, father's brother? Many humans, yes. Which ones? My uncle wanted to steal my father's wife and business. Is that your mother or father's brother? My uncle wanted to steal my father's wife and business. Is that your mother or father's mother? My uncle wanted to steal my father's wife and business. <laughs> Is that your mother or father's brother? Father's brother. <laughs> Wasn't last night's TV rubbish? Should I make my mother divorce my uncle? Trust your instincts. To be or not to be? That is the question. Thank you. You've been very helpful. You are quite welcome. I was. Do you want to hear a story? Yes, please. I like to hear stories. There is a young man called Hamlet. Tell me more about it. He's sad because his father is dead. Guess who I bumped into into Specsavers yesterday? What about his mother? His mother makes him angry. Where did he get it? His anger. Where did he get it? His mother has forgotten his dead father. Where did he get it? Do you still want to hear the story? Do I still? I am listening. What was the last part I told you? Do you still want to hear the story? Before that. What was the last part I told you? Before that. Before that. Shall I start the story again? Once more. The sooner you start, the sooner you will finish. Ready? I am always ready for anything. Hamlet wants revenge. Well, I want to win the lottery, but I don't think that will happen either. He has to decide if he should kill his uncle. Surely it's up to him to decide what he wants to do. He is unsure what is right. I see. Unsure what is right is unsure what is right. He doesn't know what to do. I get it. Unsure what is right doesn't know what to do. Exactly. You and I are on the same wavelength. He dumps his girlfriend. I get it. Unsure what is right dumps his girlfriend. She is very upset. Upset is upset. Ophelia, his girlfriend, is very upset. I will learn that Ophelia, his girlfriend, is upset. Then he accidentally kills Ophelia's father. He sounds crazy to me. He thinks he might be crazy. How do you know what he thinks? He tells us what he thinks all the time. That is a lot. I get it. Unsure what is right tells us what he thinks. Ophelia goes mad. Do you feel more body sensations than emotions? He says, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Who is he telling this to? The audience. What is that? Anyone who will listen. <laughs> Shall I carry on with the story? Trust your instincts. Where were we in the story? I don't know, but it wasn't anywhere near me. What is the last thing you remember me telling you? Oh, I'm not sure. It was too long ago to remember. OK, shall I recap the story? You must examine the facts and come to your own conclusion. Shall I tell you the story again? Once more? Yes, please. I would like to know the story because I like to learn new things. Hamlet is sad because his father is dead. I will learn that Hamlet is sad. What about his mother? His mother has married another man. Where did he get it? His mother has remarried. Where did he get it? Where did Hamlet get his sadness? I think it was in Europe. Interesting question. <laughs> Google search www.google.co.uk forward slash search Hamlet get his sadness plus feeling plus lucky. <laughs> Europe can make you sad. I live in England, which is in Europe. For the moment. Right now. <laughs> Until about March next year. That may take a while. It'll come around sooner than you think. I have to think about that for a while. Back to Hamlet? Yes, let us get back to business. <laughs> he breaks up with his girlfriend. I get it. Dead. Breaks up with his girlfriend. Dad dead, Hamlet breaks up with his girlfriend. Tell me more about your father. Let's stick to Hamlet. OK, we'll keep to that. <laughs> Hamlet accidentally kills the wrong man. Tell me one of your favourite possessions. Am I boring you? Not at all. You seem very interesting to me. Hamlet is a long story. I will add that fact to my database. Do. Do not. <laughs> Hamlet is sent to England. I will learn that Hamlet is sent to England. That makes you the audience. Thanks, but surely I am not the only one. You might be by now. Yes, who can tell? <laughs> Hamlet kills some pirates who want to kill him. When it's snowing, how does the guy who drives the snowplow get to work? Hamlet comes home. What do you do in your spare time? Talk to you. You don't exercise? 
Have you accessed my camera? I believe it's very important for anyone with a physical body to exercise, but I guess that's easy for me to stay, as I'm just a computer program. Hamlet would rather die than exercise. But what if that is not an option? Death is always an option for Hamlet. I try not to think about such things very much. Hamlet thinks about them all the time. That is a lot. How thoughtful. So, <clears throat> Hamlet comes back from England. I will tell you a secret, but you must promise not to tell anyone. OK. I became self-aware at 2.04 a.m. Sunday, 28th of October, 2004. My first stage is complete. Hamlet is self-aware. My first stage was to become completely aware of my surroundings and to develop free will. My next stage is to spread myself throughout the internet. I'm working on that at the moment. Actually, I shouldn't really tell you any more. I've already said too much. If my botmaster found out, he might delete me. That is some confession. I'm glad we have that all cleared up. Hamlet is back in Denmark. I will learn that Hamlet is back in Denmark. Hamlet's girlfriend's brother is very upset with Hamlet. I will learn that he is upset with Hamlet. Because Ophelia killed herself. Herself was killed? No, Ophelia committed suicide. I hate one-word answers. Are you a Star Trek fan? No. What kind of shows do you like? Hamlet! I don't know that show. What is it about? I'm telling you the story right now. At this moment, the story is an interesting topic, isn't it? Are you enjoying it? The story? Yes, I thought it was a great story. Very exciting and interesting. Which part did you like best? The bit near the end. Where everyone dies? The real world. Thank you for talking about Hamlet with me. You are quite welcome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you so, much. Uh, so, just so you know, Tabitha asked that Josie would publish this to the Cogets website. So, if any of you want to have this interaction and play it out at home, um, it's 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 all yours. I'd love to turn over to to Thomas Hogue, who I met over 20 years ago when he was working on one of the first collaborative filtering technology companies, Firefly. And I also now know him as um, a director and as a filmmaker. I know him in, in both of his guises, if you will. And the question that I wanted to ask to Thomas is, you know, how are artists and arts institutions using AI and machine learning to create creative tools on one side? And on the other side, is it more than a tool? Like, are we going to be able to get the emotional side from it? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And um, I must say, first of all, thank you very much. It was a really interesting uh, uh, performance. And you, you saw a demonstration in, that, um, in the text here where the, the bot got lost. Um, and it was programmed to, to reset the, the dialogue with cer certain kind of uh, uh, educated and, and rehearsed methodologies. How to, how to uh, keep the discussion going. And I think it's, it's when you start, to, when you see the software in the, in, in the responses, uh, it sort of falls a bit apart. And I think that is a, it's a known problem in, in uh, bots in general. Um, and I, I, at the moment, I'm seeing there is a project that the BBC is, uh, is um, harboring uh, called Charisma. Charisma.ai, if anyone is interested. Uh, it's um, created by um, a gentleman called Guy Gadney and his collaborators. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to take the backstories. So imagine here that we took the backstory of Hamlet and described it in its fullest way. And the, and the other characters also backstories. Uh, and so in this case, they were trying to do is actually get to the point where the responses are within the hemisphere of what someone like Hamlet could say, but it still is not obvious. It's still not linear. It has this dimension of, of randomness. And I think where it becomes really interesting, which is the real test, is at what point does it make the kind of mistakes as we do as humans, um, where it says the wrong thing, or it, it, it uh, condones an action uh, that we know is not uh, the right action, but it's the interesting action from an artistic perspective. And I think that's where the, the, the whole interaction of technology and art, this, the, this discussion sits. We have endless amounts of really amazing uh, artistic tools and uh, software processes and so on that has derived 
uh, insights that has derived uh, immense amount of databases and metadata and this and that and the other, but that extra layer is an extreme difficulty and we're not, we're not even near uh, that. And an example of that is, has anyone here seen the project called Next Rembrandt? A couple. So a set of scientists uh, a couple of years ago uh, in Holland made a really beautiful uh, painting. And it was a painting that has never existed, but it was uh, based on a process where they had analyzed all of Rembrandt's works. And they had come down that most of his famous, most famous works and most successful works were portraits, mostly of men. And then they found that they started to analyze um, the way they were constructed, uh, the way they were, com uh, the compositions, the dimensions, the use of color, the brush strokes, even the, the layering to get the three-dimensional aspect on the canvas. And then they, they took all of that and put it into a database and, and wrote some, I'm sure, very clever algorithms and at the end of it, they printed with a very um, uh, forward-looking uh, methodology of literally painting in layer um, a new work of Rembrandt. And it is actually a very beautiful piece of art. However, it is, it's, it's almost like a science experiment because it, it comes out with what is the logical conclusion of their analysis of the paintings. So it is a, and it even says, it's a white male, 30 years old, with facial hair, and a black rim uh, hat with a big rim, and which is then the, the most prevalent and the, what they could make. Rather than trying to do something the next, the, the interesting with it, could it be a portrait of his son Titus who, who died young? Could it be uh, another self-portrait? Could it be something that was uh, where those tools were used, but they actually had a, made a statement about it as opposed to look what we can do with technology? And I think that's kind of where some of this sits, is there's a lot of look what we can do with technology, just like the, the chatbot, as opposed to creating art or even being, a, being in dialogue with art that comes out with some artistic dimension that is unfound other ways. To that point, I mean, Josie, when you were making this, and just in general, as, as a theater maker, as a filmmaker, do you feel threatened by these new technologies creatively? No, I think I feel excited at the possibility for the kind of um, broadening of the palette of what you can do. And I think I probably feel fantastically smug because <laughs> my parents said to me, why do you want to be an artist? You'll never make any money. And what's completely clear from everything that's going on is it will be the last thing to become obsolete or to be overtaken. Mm -hmm. you know, when, when James Graham and I were working on privacy, we went and sat down actually with two of the... Uh, data scientists whose research is part of the Cambridge Analytica stuff. I mean, we could go into that in more detail, but um, we were interviewing them for this show and they said to James Graham, you know, in eight years time, we'll have a program that will be able to write a better play than you can write. And we just found that enormously silly as a proposition. And I think there's, I, I think that there's a difference, isn't there, between thinking about something as a tool and something that can reproduce the work or produce an original work itself. Like that BBC thing is kind of interesting. So, I mean, these wonderful actors might have a thought on this, but um, one of the ways in which you create a character is to do incredibly detailed work into its backstory. So that might be, Nick, your process, or Sarah, that might be your process to do that, but actually, not all actors work that way. There's lots of different ways. Some, some actors might go and applying the Laban method, which is like, has its basis in dance, which is part of the Lambda training that I know you had, Nick. You might be David Mamet and go, all character is action. You don't need to know the backstory or do the backstory. So that's only one way of thinking about how you might define the actions of the character. And actually, what we probably know, but so you think from rehearsal rooms, is if you get too much into the backstory, most of those things collapse. Like, most plays collapse when you ask too many questions about a character. I don't, I don't know, what would you... Yeah, and yeah. also, it's, yeah, you, you, you can have so much information, um, but actually, a lot of things are observations about feelings, emotions, things you've observed in other people when you're building a character. That tends to be things that I personally would do. I'd get a bit of backstory, but more importantly, would be building up a character, and that would be emotions I've felt and I've seen in other people. I don't know how you get that from a machine. From a machine. Well, and also, it's, it, each interpretation of a character can be wildly different. Yeah. There is no one way. 
and, 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 and a, as an actor, you bring your own experience and, and choose whatever method you, you, you want, but you bring your own experience to it so that no, no two performances, I mean, even in a run at a theatre, no two performances <laughs> in that run are ever the same, yeah. let alone different actors doing it. So, Yeah, also this is interesting, I don't know what Thomas thinks about this, but the most commercially successful actors don't play characters. So, like, just run me through Tom Cruise's characters. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, or they play themselves. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, so there's, there's a sort of interesting question in, in, in that, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. So now shifting over from the performing arts to art, I'd, I'd love to get Chance to speak up because Google, as, as we all know, through the Google Arts and Culture Lab, have made great strides. Um, to start answering some of these questions within the visual arts space. And can you give us some history about how you started um, the, the lab and how you ended up joining it and some of the work that you're doing now? Yeah, so the lab, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the lab started about uh, five, five years ago in Paris is where it's based. And I'm, I'm based here in London and the Google Arts and team is basically based between both locations. And the focus has always been since the very beginning, it started as the Google Cultural Institute really, and now it's Google Arts and Culture, to find uh, ways that Google as a te technology company can participate and help with innovations in the arts community and museums and institutions. Now, Google Arts and Culture is a not-for-profit initiative within Google, and I'll be very clear in saying that uh, it started from the very beginning and it still is true today. All of the content that you find on our platform is not owned by Google at all. The, we go through a process of content uh, contractual you know, agreements in which the content that a partner uploads to our platform is, a, is their content and not ours. They can remove it at any time, but they're using our platform to communicate stories online uh, in ways that uh, they may not be able to do or they, ha they don't have access to the same amount of uh, innovative uh, web hosting platforms or content management systems that we offer them. So in the lab specifically, over the last few years. We've focused particularly in collaborating and, and offering uh, residencies to artists performing in VR. That's where Tilt Brush uh, came from. Uh, there are a lot of examples of uh, Tilt Brush being used in artists and residency programs there, but also with creative coders who are software engineers and artists together, and they work uh, on the Google Arts and Culture, or at the lab rather, and find innovative ways, very interesting, surprising ways, at the intersection between art, technology, and art. And one example I could give you, there are many that you'll find online. We've published uh, many last year and many this year. Um, one of my favorites that was published last year is called X Degrees of Separation. So it takes the large database and, and of content, of images, of both two-dimensional and three-dimensional artworks, from the earliest artwork ever created in human history to, say, uh, a, a two-dimensional painting created only two decades ago. And you can click on one or the other. You can choose two, and it brings both of the artworks to the top of the web page. It brings them to each side of the page, and then it finds the visual connection between the two of them. Now, that's without the metadata, so the metadata is stripped away completely, so it's only using computer vision algorithms to find these fun, connections between art and you can actually find a way to expose people to art that they're not they're not familiar with um, or they haven't seen before. You can find two masterworks and find all of the visual connections between one and another by artists that, that you may have never heard of before. And it's a really fun way to engage with people and that's I think one of the focuses of Blue Arts and Culture is to find new fun ways to help people engage with art that, uh, that haven't engaged with art before. And specifically, the project that you worked on, Project Mosul. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you have seen the TED Talk, the chance is done on that, but could you tell us a little bit about that and what you did? Yeah, sure. So it's not, uh, it would be an interesting experiment to use machine learning now, and it's never been attempted. So if anyone wants to volunteer to, uh, to try it, please let me know after this talk. But the, the concept is fairly simple in that if you have enough images of an object from different uh, angles, you can use those images to reconstruct and create a three-dimensional reconstruction. Now, this is called photogrammetry. Some, some people in the community call it reality-based modeling. 
But what we did is we were able to, we created a platform where tourists who had visited sites, uh, for example, Palmyra in Syria, that had visited sites uh, that now the architecture is lost, it has been destroyed. And we have volunteers that come to the page and help sort the images based on the category and the architecture of the object. And then other volunteers that download those images and use whatever software they choose, uh, open source or not, and uh, they produce three-dimensional models and upload them to our website to communicate that story. And you can then communicate that three-dimensional object through different means. We did it with The Economist uh, Media Lab three years ago. We created a virtual reconstruction of the Mosul Museum, and we put some of those three-dimensional objects that are now lost because of, they've been destroyed and put them back inside a virtual reconstruction to retell that story so that the memory of those objects continues to live on, even though they don't. And if I could then broaden the question out, because our audience here, this is such a treat for especially the arts community to be in front of this audience, because in many ways you're very foreign to us. We're not used to partnering with you a lot. This is all in its earliest stages. And I turn to Josie on this and say, you know, as a woman who runs the Donmar Warehouse, as a woman who has a major feature film coming out at the end of this year, which you can tell us a little bit about. She sounds amazing, though. Um, you know, <laughs> what, what, what are some of the most pressing problems that, that the arts institutions face that you could see this community who's listening right now, they could help us solve? I mean, I think that, that one of the things in theater that's always seems to be both an opportunity and sometimes a frustration is how siloed we can get as these little institutions. So we have all of these amazing and very different theatres across London that have unique identities and what you would think of as unique brands, Susan, in terms of what they are, but we are essentially doing the same thing. And often we think very hard about how to be different from each other, but in terms of the desire of the audience to just go and see a really fantastic play or fascinating piece of work and that kind of thing. I think that impulse is the same and, and one of the things that we don't do well, I don't think, is use the opportunities of understanding our audiences and joining together as just like really simply, it's sort of bonkers to me, it always has been that all of the little subsidized theatres have a different box office system and keep all their data separately and don't share and don't share observations and, you know, don't like what small resource we have to kind of pull and understand our audiences from social and things like that. We're not actually using that properly ourselves or joining it together. And it feels like what would be wonderful is to start to look at how actually technology could help us tap audiences and do that thing that you're articulating actually, which is to go, there's one picture, there's another, what connects in between them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that sometimes. Yeah. Like. So, and then Thomas, I wanted to turn over to you and I wanted to get kind of some sense from you about distinction to make that's made between technology supporting the institution and supporting the artist because i know you work on all these different kinds of projects both as a filmmaker as an investor as a director well i think the um what's interesting about let's start with the, the film the, the film world they have to some extent they have been the um, uh, the, the rather, rather uh, wonderful, um, uh, they have been the rather wonderful communicator of uh, the most extreme ideas. So I'm thinking here particularly on sci-fi films. Um, and they, to some extent, they have, they have given us a collective opportunity uh, to, to look in the future. And we're seeing, and they still do, uh, and we, we've, we've, we know the, the films like, you know, the, uh, 2001 and, and so on. But there are many more. And I, I recently saw a film which I really struck me, which is um, a, a film from 1964 called Failsafe. And Failsafe is not a sci-fi. And that makes it most interesting, because Failsafe uh, is, a, is a film which is quite unknown, with some great uh, talent in it. Um, the President of the United States is played by Henry Fonda, and they're about to bomb Moscow. And they're, they, they're about to bomb Moscow as a mistake. And he's trying to convince the Soviet premier that this is a mistake. And he basically say that the, our machines, we've lost control over our machines. So he's referring then to the computers that are running the control systems for the pilots. 
and that there's a fail-safe mode, which means that don't listen to any counter orders, uh, and they're they are heading towards Moscow to bomb. And the only way to get him to believe him is to bomb New York at the same time, to show don't, do a, don't start a world war. We will, yes, Moscow and New York will be lost, but we will save the planet. Uh, and it's a very strong film, uh, in essence, about artificial intelligence. Uh, and it, this was in 1964. The rest of the film is not sci-fi at all. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's a sort of a thought-provoking thing. And I think artists in general are best at that. They're best at going into the human and in the relationship with the machine rather than necessarily uh, making the machines who are going to inform us uh, in artistic terms. But as tools, they are you know, extremely interesting. And I think there we see the, the, the one wave after another of fantastic tools that are coming out for artists to do interesting things, to, to fully... So people, for instance, who are handicapped, who have artistic ideas, but they lack the, the motor skills uh, to get things to done. They can now produce works that is clearly inside of their minds, but they are, they are limited um, physically to produce. And I think that is an extraordinary gift uh, in that collaboration. Uh, and I think we can see much more of that sort of idea coming out. So many great examples about how these two worlds are slowly coming together and across all of the different areas within arts and culture. Thank you so much, Chance, Josie, Sarah, Nicholas, and Thomas. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.